Harry Rilling, and I'm the former police chief in Norwalk. Served on the Norwalk Police Department for 41 years, 17 years as chief. I believe those 17 years um, has given me the experience necessary. Uh, Norwalk Police Department is one of the biggest departments in the city of Norwalk. We had a staff of well over 200 people, and I managed 17 multi-million dollar budgets. And for all intents and purposes, those budgets came in. Uh, we lived within the budget, uh, and uh, very uh, often actually turned money back into the city of Norwalk at the end of the uh, fiscal year. I believe that um, my platform is based on three uh, core values that I talked about the day of the debate. Uh, that's service, experience, and leadership. And I believe I'm the person that can put Norwalk back on the right track and give the citizens of Norwalk the value that they deserve for their tax dollars. When I say service, uh, I was graduated from Norwalk High School and uh, shortly thereafter enrolled in the military for a period of four years. When I left the military, I answered my city's call for service and uh, joined the Norwalk Police Department, uh, where I served, as I mentioned, for 41 years, and very, very proud to have risen through the ranks. Uh, Norwalk uh, homegrown, and uh, eventually was named chief in 1995. Um, so I believe that uh, that experience has prepared me, uh, the service that my country, the service to my community, the experience of running a major department that uh, I believe I'm one of the only candidates that has uh, that experience. And uh, again, I believe that um, I'm the person with the greatest amount of experience and leadership that uh, the city right now needs. During the time that I was chief, uh, I worked very, very well with the uh, union presidents who served during my tenure, and um, they they had an open door policy. Uh, I, they could come in and see me at any time. We would discuss issues and try to resolve them in-house. So during your 17 years as chief, what was the toughest decision you had to make, be it labor issues, uh, emergency, uh, an incident, you name it? I think the most difficult time was when you have to make a decision, well, we had to make a decision uh, or the most difficult experience I had was when uh, Officer Morelli passed. And we had national media here, and it was a very, very trying time for the department because we were conducting parallel uh, investigations. One, parallel, uh, one investigation suggested that possibly he had been confronted by an armed adversary based on the initial information we had. We also felt very early on in the investigation that it might have been self-inflicted. And, you know, we had people ca calling us from all over the United States prepared to come to the service. Uh, the, thing that, uh, the thing that I feel, it, it, the, the three issues that I've always focused on, right, education, development, crime, well actually four issues, and, and civility and government. Um, Education, we have a very good school system, but it used to be that people <coughs> would come to Norwalk to bring their children to our schools, and now they're, they're, they're leaving, and, or they're sending their children to private schools. Um, we have to look at uh, exactly what, we owe our children an education. And we owe our children a fully funded Board of Education. But there's, knowing the, the way the city operates and knowing uh, other departments and knowing how the, the budget process works, I know that there's areas where we can cut and where we can uh, save money that we can channel and put into the Board of Education budget. And Norwalk um, is struggling right now. Norwalk is struggling. Home values have declined 11% between 2011-2012. It costs 32% more than a state average to live in Norwalk, but the median income is only 6% higher. Um, people, if they want to sell their homes and move into a larger home, they can't afford to right now because they're struggling to make ends meet. Um, so there are there are other ways, that there are other places, there are foundations that are, are, if you applied these foundations for uh, funding, I believe it was Dr. Marx who may have found five or ten million dollars, I'm not sure exactly what it was, um, but she found money 
that she brought into the school system. You know, um, <clears throat> I think that mixed use development is something that a city should be aggressively pursuing. And I don't think we're pursuing it aggressively enough. I think that um, we're kind of just letting things happen as they happen. I, I don't think that, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily an advocate of taking affordable housing out of a brand new development and putting it someplace where the amenities are so much less. What I'm saying is you bring in affordable housing, I'm sorry, you bring in mixed use development where you have residential and retail together. You have to provide opportunities for young people, giving them alternatives to a life of crime or gang membership. Early 2000s, the city was slow to admit or deny that there was gang activity maybe operating in the city. Um, do you regret that, or was that not your decision? And how do you think you address those kind of issues now? No, it was, you have to look at what gangs were always, law enforcement always had the definition of a gang would be a highly organized national organization such as Latin Kings, um, the Bloods, the Crips, and that was what law enforcement was operating under at that time. <clears throat> we had to change with the changing times, and perhaps we were a little slow. But what happened was now you were having pockets of neighborhood gangs that by all means were gangs. And we took our lead from Miami, um, Miami-Dade County, who eventually listed 10 criterion and saying, if you meet three or four of these, then you're a gang member. And they would actually interview people. And we learned from them. So it wasn't only in Norwalk that we were slow to admit or that it was different. We didn't admit right away of a gang problem because we, it didn't look like a gang problem. You know, it's not, it wasn't the old, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and it's a duck. It was walking like a duck and perhaps quacking like a duck, but we didn't recognize it as a duck because of the definition we had had. So um, it wasn't intentional. Um, once we started realizing what was happening, and we admitted that, yeah, we do have some, we have gang members in our walk. Initial savings with privatizing, but look what happened here. People that had garbage collection on Monday weren't going to get their garbage collection until the following Saturday. That's something somebody should have caught. How did that slip through? How did that get into the contract? How did somebody get a 10-year contract? A 10-year contract is a long period of time to have to be married to something without having opportunities unless there was just cause for breaking the contract. Secondly, you know, you lose control over the quality of the employee when you privatize something. You lose control of the hiring process. You lose control of the vetting process. Uh, city employees become part of the family. And they have a dedication to the city and they want to do a good job because they want their department to look good and you have greater control over them. So I am not a fan of, or not an advocate of privatizing. I think that uh, when you do that, you give up a lot of control over uh, people from all areas of town, people from all walks of life, people from both sides of the aisle come to me on their own, not solicited, and say to me, we're, in, we're behind you. We want you to win. And that, to me, is gratifying. Whether I get the endorsement or not, whether I win the primary or not, whether I win the election or not, the fact that people have confidence in me and people believe that I'm the person for the job or that I can do the job, the fact that I have two mayors who have done the job sitting on my uh, campaign team, they've done the job, they've worked with me, they've seen me work, and they feel that I'm the person for the job, or I think he would find it a little bit difficult to criticize me to any great degree. He, he, um, he uh, extended my contract three times. The last time, um, it was his idea to extend it. Um, and that was the 2011, uh, just before the 2011 election. And uh, he appointed me the zoning commission. And I would hope, again, that 
civil discourse would be the rule. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've been quoted in the past saying it, and I'll, I'll say it again. There's two ways to have the tallest building in town. You tear everybody else's building down, or you build the tallest building. My campaign has decided that we are going to do our best to build the tallest building and let the people make the decision. So I, oh, go ahead. I think that I think that being negative and being overly critical, criticize where criticism is due is, is one thing. And there's a way to criticize in a civil manner. But when you become overly critical and when you become overly nasty, I think that turns against you very, very quickly. People don't like it. I can't see how they could make a driving range in that area. I've walked it. I've walked that area. How they could make a driving range in that area and get a return on their investment in 20 years. I mean, it's going to be extremely expensive. It's going to take a lot of blasting. It's going to take a lot of uh, landscaping. It's going to be end up very, very close to some homes there. It's not going to be open at night, so you're, you're not going to have the lighting there, so you're only going to be open certain hours. I will tell you this, that I was not on the Zoning Commission when um, the mosque was uh, denied or when the vote was taken. I did sit in on one executive session where an attorney representing the city made some recommendations. Coming out of that meeting, they took a public vote that did not per se approve the mosque, but approved it subject to an agreement in federal court. And that action had to be taken so that they could talk about an agreement. It would be um, more parking, and they could build the type of mosque that they wanted to build. So you need to bring people to the table early on in the process, step in, show leadership, and and try to, to negotiate a deal where it's acceptable to everyone. Every department head, I would have a monthly staff meeting with each of my department, with, with the entire, with all the department heads. They would be um, submitting to me monthly reports. I, in the past eight years as chief, or the last eight years as chief, I think I probably went to three department head meetings of, of little or no substance. But I would have one on a monthly basis where the department heads would have a, a report submitted to me. And I would want to know um, the goals and objectives that they have set and how they're um, reaching those goals and objectives, the progress towards them. I would want to know uh, where they are as, in regards to their budget. And if they are overexpended, they would, uh, I would be asking them why and to give me an, an explanation. When you have a blizzard, when you have flooding, when you have hurricanes, I've been in the emergency operations center and I've had to make the decisions as to how many resources, what resources to deploy, when to, uh, where to deploy them, how do we uh, uh, account for, you know, we can't count on our neighbors because they're going through the same thing we have, so we can't count on mutual aid. So we have to uh, um, uh, accommodate our, our first responders. Uh, so, when I got to a position of leadership in the department, I felt the best thing that I should do is to be an unaffiliated person so I can't be accused of uh, being politically uh, manipulated or uh, bringing politics into the police department. And the average tenure of a police chief in the United States, you know what it is? Three years. Because I felt I worked well with mayors from both parties, with councils from both parties. They recognized the fact that I was a fair, impartial person who would not be politically manipulated. Um, I recognized who I worked for. I worked for the city of Norwalk, the people that uh, live here. I worked for the mayor. I worked for the common council. Um, I worked for my officers. I used to tell my officers, you know, on paper, you all work for me. But in reality, I work for you. And my job is to get you the training, the skills, and the tools to do your job, to do it well, and to stay safe so you can go home every night to your family.